From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, a Ben J. Shap LLC production. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. We'll unearth the real-world experiences of some of the brightest minds in the marketing and technology space so you can learn the tools, tips, and tricks they've learned along the way. Now here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome back to the MarTech Podcast. Okay. In today's episode, we're going to replay one of this podcast's first episode where I was fortunate enough to sit down with Jordan Cooney, who is one of our podcast sponsors and a world-renowned expert in driving organic growth and search engine optimization. Jordan is the general manager of the U.S. market at Searchmetrics. In the first part of this interview, which we republished yesterday, Jordan walked us through his background, his role at Search Metrics, and the keys to creating an effective growth strategy. It's a very insightful conversation, and if you want to learn about the foundation of SEO, I recommend you go back and give that episode a listen. In today's episode, Jordan's going to walk us through the difference in investing in paid advertising and earned media. He's also going to talk us about how to use content as a marketing vehicle and give us an overview of the tools that SEOs use to drive business results at an enterprise level. Jordan's a brilliant guy. I hope you enjoy this episode. Here's the second part of our interview with Jordan Cooney from Searchmetrics. So remind me again the three important aspects. First and foremost, it starts off by providing a quality piece of content or some quality experience. Basically, unique content, something that's well-written, that's differentiated, that hasn't been written on the internet before. Correct. Okay. Number two? Accessibility. Google has to be able to access this content, know that the content exists, is aware of the content. There's a huge checklist of things that you have to do around that. Okay. And then the third step was? Awareness. So generating recognition by being published or shared across other sites. All right. So it's about having unique, interesting content. You have to start with a good product. It has to be accessible so people can actually view the content when it's there. And other people have to give a signal to say that the content is interesting. That's sort of the SEO 101. How does search metrics help people at an enterprise level, large scale accomplish those things? Let's start with accessibility and awareness. We have a great set of technical tools and data that allow you to understand how either a competitors are doing or how you yourself are performing over time, and then measure the rank and rank position of keywords that matter most to your business. That's how we're really able to help with the accessibility and the awareness piece. On the first one, which is really around unique and quality content, as I mentioned before, we've built this content experience platform that allows you to take in all those factors and then understand how you are essentially differentiating and producing a piece of content that would outperform the market. That is the core benefit of that tool, but ultimately one of the greatest unique positions about it is that there's no one else in the industry that can collect that volume of data and then for a single piece of content, interpret and help you understand how to rank and perform better. So talk to me about, you know, there's this rich sort of technology and data that Search Metrics has built. Talk to me about who are the customers that benefit from this type of service. At first, it really includes players who are heavily dependent on online traffic. That's really kind of where it starts. And from there, it kind of branches out into a variety of different areas. So we'll also have businesses that need help in understanding and measuring their awareness. We'll have government or regulatory organizations that want to use this data to monitor and track certain industries or organizations. So the core of our customer base are companies who really want to leverage and grow their search traffic. 
So help me think about why companies focus on driving organic presence. Why is that any better than offline presence or you know, why is it different than paid acquisition for traffic? It's actually really interesting what's going on right now. Just this week, or it might have even been late last week, uh, Toys R Us, who had filed for bankruptcies, decided to, to shut down their stores. And this is really a driving force in many ways from the realization that consumers have changed the, the way that they shop and they buy products. We don't just consume from physical retail the same way we did 20 years ago. So the companies are learning to adapt and become competitive in this new way that consumers buy and consume products. And I'm sure that it will even change again in the next 20, 40 years. Today, consumers have so much access to both knowledge and information about products to a degree that they've never had before. And on top of that, they have the ability to purchase and almost instantaneously acquire those products. You can do that all online. So the brands and the businesses who are not present online, who are not accessing consumers online, are simply at a competitive disadvantage. So the market is changing, and I don't think it's too far-fetched to believe that in the short order, the market will change again. And many of the same principles and practices that we talk about when it comes to search will become present and aware as we evolve our consumer habits and behaviors. In a few years from now, and you know this sounds crazy, but you'll be able to buy a product from your refrigerator. When you run out of eggs, your refrigerator will know that there's no more eggs in it, and it will order eggs from whatever is the best price, fastest delivery, whatever your consumer buying habits are, it will get those eggs to your doorstep. And that is the future of buying. Again, all of that's going to be determined based on accessibility, what information is available to these products so that your refrigerator can make the best possible selection for you. So I understand that there's this generational shift in terms of purchase behavior. And you said Toys R Us is a great example. People don't go to physical retail stores to do their research to buy their products. They're doing online research. Talk to me about the difference between if as a marketer, buying traffic, right? Doing advertising, there's Google, there's SEM search engine marketing, and there's SEO search engine optimization. Help me understand the balance between purchasing traffic and organic traffic, and what are the differences and why is one better than the other? I think this is a really interesting topic because if you really think of more traditional marketing tactics and marketing knowledge and experience, it really actually suits well when it comes to the buying traffic components. So when you're either buying ads or buying display or whatever it might be, it's really a byproduct of measuring certain KPIs to be efficient, whether it's ROI or brand awareness. It is very much a mathematical application of marketing. And I think that is really what makes the individuals who do that very successful. And it has an excellent place in the marketplace. It's never going to go away. People are always going to be buying advertising to grow their brand and grow their revenue. The unique difference, though, between advertising and search engine optimization, or what you would call organic marketing, is that fundamentally, it is a different set of practices and skills that make you successful. It is a hybrid of both being an artist and a technical tactician. In the same sentence, you can talk to an SEO And he can be telling you that the creative needs to change and the technical infrastructure of your site is deficient. And that can be very challenging because it becomes a game of priorities. And this is why at Searchmetrics, we believe that data justifies those priorities. And you can make a decision one day to change the way that your marketing copy might look, and it might have a negative impact on your business. And you can use data to justify that, to prove that that marketing copy change created poor performance. On the flip side, the idea here is that although it is not as quantifiable, it is as important for organic marketers to understand how they can leverage the variety of data and that it is not always a one plus one equation to success. That's the biggest difference 
in my opinion, between what you would consider advertisers and organic marketers. I think that there's two components to the difference between driving paid traffic and organic traffic. Paid acquisition, as you mentioned, is is very ROI driven, right? It's a calculation of if I spend a dollar, do I get more than a dollar back? And if I do, I'm going to advertise as much as I can or have the budget to be able to do. With organic growth, you're creating an asset that becomes, if you do it the right way, increasingly valuable over time that you only have to pay for once and that you can continue to syndicate and reuse. So Jordan, uh, years ago when we were working together at eBay, I, I left to start my startup. It was a guitar lesson website to connect guitar students and teachers for live lessons. And one of the things that you helped me understand is that I needed to create content to get people to my website And that would be a marketing channel that became more valuable over time. So I started creating recorded guitar videos and blog posts and transcriptions of different songs for helping people how to play guitar because that's the content my customers wanted. Those blog posts, when organized in the right fashion, generated more traffic over time. And I only had to create them once as opposed to with an advertisement, I can publish the advertisement. And then once it's done, and once I have that revenue, it's recognized and it's gone. And so essentially, when you're doing paid advertising, you're setting up a toll booth. When you're creating organic content, you have an asset that you can continue to build on over time. And the more you invest in organic growth, the more value you get out of it over time. That said, I want to ask you a question. When, when people are starting to build organic growth, are there any data points or expectations that you can help them set for how much they need to invest in creating a content channel? And what is the timeline it takes for that to start bearing fruit? As you're starting up your business, I think the first thing for you to understand is your market. What is the audience in the market that you're trying to go after? Who are the consumers? Who are the readers or users that you want to capture? The more you understand that, the better off you're going to be in producing a valuable piece of content that really makes sense. I'm sure that you would agree, Ben, that when you are building up content for your business, the higher quality pieces of content were ones that had a drawn connection to the guitar and music community. And that's why you were able to leverage the growth from that to generate users to your platform. The truth is the content that was the most valuable to me was the content that other sites that had higher authority, and I'd love eventually for you to tell us what authority means to Google, but the content that other people shared ended up being the most valuable over time. And that's the key, right? That's that third element around awareness. So if you can generate awareness, and a lot of people do this, right? I mean, a lot of people will just produce a piece of content to generate awareness, and there's nothing wrong with that. And that's a key foundational building block of having a successful search strategy. But if you're just getting started off, as you asked before, the first and foremost activity is to understand your audience, understand who you're trying to reach. And then it's really doing a high-level competitive analysis of what's happening within that content space. And the better insights you have around the competition, the more likely you are to perform better with that piece of content. And it can take time, right? If you're starting from scratch, where you have a website that's never been exposed before, you can expect that it will take time. It doesn't happen overnight, and especially that awareness piece. That is the hardest piece that it takes an effort to capitalize on. On the flip side, if you have an established brand and you have a presence already online, it becomes more of a how to understand different ideas and tactics to scale and grow. I think that's the biggest thing that I urge people to understand the difference when you're advertising is that you can create a piece of content in a vacuum. It might not be very valuable. If you create a series of content and you're constantly investing in building content, what you'll find is you'll generate more organic growth over time. The content becomes more valuable as opposed to you advertise, you put a dollar in, you get a dollar out in real time, but then you need to keep investing to get that same return. Yep. So Jordan, talk to me about when you're starting to produce content, how do you recommend that companies start thinking about what content to produce? When it comes to starting off in producing content, The first element of being successful at this is analyzing the topics you want to cover. 
oftentimes companies and brands, they kind of already think that they have the topics prioritized, but what they don't realize is that the competitive environment that exists in SEO is very different than what they believe the competitive environment is in the four walls of their office. So topic selection, I believe, is one of the most important and overlooked aspects. Nine out of 10 times, what you see is companies just create a list. They say, these are the things we want to write about. And they use very little insight or knowledge to determine why they're writing about those topics. At Search Metrics, we believe that topic selection is something that should be analyzed based on the competitiveness, the value, so I have an actual price or number behind it, and then a variety of different input factors that you feel you can actually address in the content that you're producing. So taking, and that's a very high level generalized description, obviously there's very specific data points behind each one of those elements, but having that kind of general framework and frame of thinking can start to help you be better at selecting topics and then going through the content creation process. So outside of using the search metric software, which has rich data and can basically tell you what you should be writing about, what are some other ways for people to who are not at an enterprise level can start thinking about creating content that people are actually looking for? So not necessarily using a platform or anything of that nature. A great way to start discovering what are the best and accurate topics is really doing some discovery in Google. One of my favorite tools to use is just the Google Suggest. So if you go into Google today and you do a search for any keyword, what Google is going to show you is all of the other relevant topics and key terms that are related to that particular keyword. That is a great tool and indication to understand how consumers search for something. So when you're typing in something, do people look for the price? Do they look for the description of it? What is the subtopic that's relevant to the, my main topic? And that right there gives you a clue into how Google looks at and understands a particular topic. The second thing I would do is I would spend a lot of time discovering what works. A lot of people overlook that there is a variety of different media types and sources and structures that work better than others. Are competitors using tables or lists? Are they using imagery or videos? Is it a collection of all these things? Is it a very short form piece of content or long form piece of content? Having a core understanding of those aspects, many of them are encapsulated in technologies like search metrics, but having a core understanding of those aspects are going to directly impact how and what you create. And that to me is a great foundation to producing better content and being more successful with your content in search. I think that one of my favorite hacks that you've shown me is, as you mentioned, going into Google. Let's say you have a topic that you want to cover. This podcast is about marketing technology. It's called the MarTech podcast. So if I want to rank for MarTech, I go into Google, I type the word MarTech and I press space and I can see what other words come up. So Google will create suggestions. The other way to understand, sort of get more suggestions is MarTech space, the letter A, and then you have all of the keywords that start with the letter A. So for example, I would get MarTech advisor. People that are searching for MarTech and the first letter being A, they're most likely to be looking for advisor. MarTech B is MarTech Boston. So there, people are looking for MarTech advisors in Boston. MarTech C might be MarTech Conference. So using Google and then playing a little bit with the alphabet to try to create a list of relevant topics is a good way to get started. Now, that doesn't necessarily give you an indication of how competitive those terms are. It just means what people are searching for. So some might be harder to rank for than others. Jordan, how do you understand what the competition is for a given keyword? There's a couple of different ways to approach this, especially if you don't have a tool. One of the greatest things is to just start looking at a lot of the free things that Google has to offer. So Google has a collection of keyword tools, keyword research tools, all typically part of the uh, experience that is their advertising experience. But these tools become just as valuable for organic marketers as any other. So understanding, say, the bid price for a particular keyword 
can really help you make a decision on how competitive and how important is this particular term. Uh, understanding seasonality and the seasonality behind a particular keyword, uh, that can also be a very useful piece of information, especially if you're in a seasonal business. So the reality is that Google's Keyword Planner and, and Keyword Tool is a great place to start for folks who don't have any experience in doing this. And then there is a variety of in slew keyword tools that exist out in the marketplace that allow you to do research and analysis and aggregate this information. Uh, the reality is that the more you understand a keyword, the better off you can be at making decisions on how to prioritize them. That's really what it comes down to because it's not about just producing one piece of content and letting it sit there. It's about understanding how to build a community of content that relates to one another, that is useful, that is productive. And that requires thoughtfulness behind prioritization and then also relationships between various pieces of content, which is what we kind of started our conversation off with when we talked about the suggested search. Of course, the answer when you're looking to do keyword research is if you're at an enterprise level context search metrics because they have the tools and software and services to be able to support you, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's great value in terms of both time and efficiency when you have an enterprise tool that becomes incredibly productive for enterprise organizations. At the end of the day, SEO, search engine optimization, content distribution is a pretty complex topic. And I feel like that's one of the reasons why marketers shy away from the channel initially is you can create content and see value that builds over time, but it is relatively complex and there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of what to focus on. And that's why you see lots of SEO agencies and consultants at the smaller level and then services like search metrics when you get into the enterprise level. Uh, Jordan, talk to me about your career goals, about what's next for you. What are you trying to accomplish at Search Metrics? So we have a great opportunity to provide consumers with the right data, get it to their fingertips. And our fundamental goal here is to ensure that all brands, all not just enterprise brands, but all online brands have the ability to use this data to compete as aggressively as possible in their respective markets. So our real goal is to expand and grow here in the U.S. market and become the market leader in search and content. And that's really the new space for us. I'd say one of the big things that we're trying to do is understand how we can expand into a content audience, become relevant to a community that is very large. There's so many different content owners and content writers, editors, and they come from various backgrounds. And our hope is that they will see the value in producing content from a data-driven perspective. Today, most writers and most content organizations start with a blank page. They start with a white page and the experience that they, they have in their mind. And that, that's great. And I think that that's a good place to start. But the writing experience can become so much more productive when you have the data and the insight that will drive your writing to reach users and consumers. We've seen it work, and we believe that we can make a bigger impact within that community. One question I have for you is, as you've gone from creating mylibros.com to being the general manager of a international B2B SaaS software for SEO, what lessons have you learned that you'd like to pass on to some of the junior marketers or people that are just starting on in their marketing and technology careers? When it comes to search, the first thing that I would always advise people who are getting started in this space is never stop learning, never stop trying new tactics, new efforts. That inspiration of innovation is something that is very much rewarded by Google. And I think it's also one of the main reasons why, even though it's only a 25 or so year old company, it's still such a present and aware and useful tool for all consumers. So a never stop innovating, I think, is one of the things that I would urge people to focus on early in their careers as they get into digital marketing and specifically search marketing. And then the second thing I would always advise people on is you can never sit and wait. A lot of people who are working with Google and trying to make search a success for their business, they often have this idea that if I just wait long enough, Google will eventually find me. That couldn't be any further from the truth. The reality is Google is constantly moving and innovating and progressing. 
And if you're not moving and innovating and progressing at that same pace, you can be assured that Google will pass you up. So always be in a position where you are pushing yourself to do the next thing. So always put yourself, put your business, put your website in a place where you fundamentally are adapting and improving and pushing the awareness that is necessary to grow in search. I think that's great advice. Last question for you. Anything that you'd like to uh, promote? How can people that are listening to this show get in touch with you and learn more about search metrics? So folks can get in touch with me on LinkedIn, uh, Jordan Cooney or uh, JT Cooney on Twitter. I'm happy to answer any questions or do any follow-up. I'd urge you to also check out our website, uh, searchmetrics.com. By all means, don't hesitate to reach out to myself or reach out through our website if you want more information. And I would say for all of those folks who are just getting started off, go and do the hard work of reading the detailed and very lengthy Google Webmaster Guidelines. If you really want to learn about this industry and you really want to get familiar with this industry, take some time and learn about what Google has determined to be a successful website on the internet. And I'll leave you with that as a resource to get yourself started. Okay, that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. If you like this podcast and you want a weekly stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. Of course, we'd love to hear your feedback. So if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to us or you can find the transcripts of our podcast at our website, martechpod.com, M-A-R-T-E-C-H-P-O-D.com. If you're enjoying this podcast, we'd also love for you to leave us a review in the Apple iTunes store. Okay, that's it for today. Next week, we'll be back with another episode of the MarTech Podcast. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. Thank you.